last week, uh, Pastor Heather knocked it out of the park. Knocked it out of the park. Uh, She was talking about invitations and empty seats. Uh, She was sharing from Luke chapter 14 and the story Jesus tells there about the, um, the banquet and the one, the master of the banquet who said, hey, let's invite people. And then they come up with all kinds of excuses on why they can't come. So then he says, all right, let's open this thing up to everybody and you go invite everybody you can find. And he invites everyone. And isn't that an amazing thing that he invites everyone? Because he doesn't just invite those he likes. He doesn't just invite those who have the most potential. He doesn't invite those who look the best or those who are the smartest. And that's why we're here. (laughs) But really, isn't that true? He doesn't invite those who have the most potential. He invited us. And I am so glad that he invited us because I don't deserve it, but his invitation went out to me. And when I had nothing lovely of me, now at this point, there's plenty lovely, but back then, I'm just saying, I was far from God and he put the invitation out to me. Isn't that beautiful? Our God is an inviting God. And actually that word that's translated as invite there shows up all through the Bible. It, sometimes it's translated as invite, but a lot of times it's also, inv- uh, it, it, it's translated as calling. And, and I was trying to read all of the times that you find that word that's translated as invite or calling, and I couldn't do it. There were so many times when you see our God calling to us, drawing us, inviting us. And that happens and has happened for thousands of years. He has been an inviting, calling God. On Thursday, I was reflecting on this and why our God has to be a calling God. And really, what I'm convinced it comes down to is the fact that we are blind and sometimes intentionally blind to his glory and to his goodness, right? So because we are blind to that, he has to, in order to reach us, call us and draw us because we're sinful species and we're broken and blinded and cannot see him and cannot know him. So he calls, he draws us and we find freedom from sin as he invites us to come, right? And seek him. He says, come and seek me, come and find me. And it's really beautiful that we have a God who, when he put the invitation out to begin with, and nobody responded, or everybody had excuses, that he didn't say, fine, I'm going to eat by myself and sit at the banquet and enjoy his own presence, because he could have. And we take it for granted that he didn't. Instead, he says, no, 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 no. I'm going to invite everybody. My first invitation was rejected. I'm going to send it out to everyone, and that's why we're here today. You and I qualify as those who were invited because the first people didn't come. Really? That's why we're here. And another way to think about it is like, here's how God works. We didn't want to see him, so we turned out the lights. Because we don't want to be bothered by the sight of him. So he uses his voice. And he speaks. And he says, come to me. Seek me. Find me. It's worth it. Because in me, you'll find what it is that you are looking for. And he never gives up. And his invitation went out to you. And it goes out to all the people who seem like they are far from him but they're not because they're close to you, your circle. Not one of them is far from him because all of them are close to you, right? And so that invitation continues to go out. And so just as there's an invitation for us, there's a calling. There's a calling for us to participate in that invitation for others. And I know that because you are a part of the church, the ecclesia, the out-called ones, the ones who have been called to go out, to come out 
and to go out, right? So he, he invites us to seek him, but then he also calls us to serve him. He calls us first to the banquet, but then he calls us more than just to a banquet. And this is what I want to talk about. If last week we were talking about a banquet and the calling to be a part of a banquet, this week I want to talk about the calling to be, to be who and what God has called us to be. I have been called to be a pastor. I've been called to preach. I've been called to be a father. I've been called to be a husband. I've been called to lead. I've been called to be a friend. And all of those callings, this is really beautiful, seem like they're disparate. And sometimes what can happen is we can put them all in their own little compartments, right? And there's this calling over here, and there's this calling here, and this. But underneath them all, there is something which unifies them. And that is, I love this passage, Colossians 3, verse 17 which says, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Do every part of your life. So, so it might seem like as a pastor, I do one thing, and as a father, I do something else. But the thing is, underneath both of those things is a worship to God and a representation of Jesus Christ. Right? Anybody with me on that? Okay. And so it unifies these pieces that can seem like they're separate, but it brings them all together. And ultimately then none of them are separated because they're unified by worship to God. So specifically today, here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about that calling to be who and what God has called us to be. And what do you do when you sense that calling? Where do you get started? How do you get the ball rolling? And maybe this is part of, for me, where we're at as we're talking about the park and as a church and how do we begin this process? Because it's been two years to get to this point and we haven't broken ground yet, right? And so I'm like, man, let's get the ball rolling. But I think also for each and every one of us, when we sense the calling of God, there is a way to get started And there's a path that we can walk. And I want to talk about what it looks like to get the ball rolling. So if Pastor Heather knocked it out of the park last week, my hope is to just get the ball rolling, okay? If she hit a home run, I'm going for a bunt. Hit the bat for me. I'll just put it in place. You throw the ball at. I think that's how it works. And then you, it'll roll forward from there, okay? So we're just going to try to get the ball rolling. Let's begin. Where do we start How do you do that? When God calls you to something and speaks to you and says, this is for you, this is what I have for you, where do you even start? Where do you even start? So grab your Bibles and open them back up to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. We're going to pick right up after the story that um, Pastor Heather read last week, the parable of the great feast, the story of the the banquet, Jesus tells another story. And and I don't think these stories happened right after each other. It's not like he went right out of one into the next. But Luke, when he was compiling his book, the gospel, as he was putting it together, he took that story and this story and said, these two are important to put next to each other. And and there's a reason why. Because one is an invitation to a banquet and the other is a calling to be something and someone. And so we want to see what Jesus says about how we get started. So we're going to pick up in verse 25, right after the end of what we read last week, okay? Here's what happens. A large crowd was following Jesus, and he turned around and he said to them, so these are people who sense the invitation to the banquet. These are people who didn't make an excuse, right? They They didn't just head off and say, oh, I got to take care of my donkey. No, these people actually came and showed up and followed Jesus. And he says to them, he turned around and he said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Now, we read this as a part of our family devotions this week, and that was fun. Uh, So it's like, hey, mom, what? Hey, brother and sister, check mark. Um, And (laughs) 
just kidding. But we did read this. This was a part of our family devotions, and it was interesting and fun to work through what Jesus is talking about here. And he continues on, and he says, And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. This is what Jesus has called us to, to come and to follow him, to be his disciple. But he says, that comes with a cost. And then he says, and don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Everything has a cost. Every calling has a cost associated with it. And I believe the higher the calling, the greater the cost. And so Jesus says, count the cost before you even begin. What is this going to cost for me to dive into what he has called me to? Every time I read this passage, I think of the McMansions in Branson. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Just north of Silver Dollar City. First time I saw those, I thought, what in the world are those things? And then I drove by them again. I'm like, what in the world are those things? It's called Indian Ridge Development. Originally, it was a $1.8 billion project. That's what it was projected to cost. It included, was supposed to include um, the mansions, a shopping district, hotel, and everything else. And they started by building these massive McMansions, right? And then they got partway done, and they gave up. And they've been sitting there ever since. And just last week, or not last week, sorry, last year, the sheriff said, please stop coming and looking at these McMansions. Because apparently somebody recorded it, put it on TikTok, and enough people heard about it that all of a sudden out of the woodworks, everybody wanted to see the mysterious McMansions, right? Because it was probably pitched as something super, what's going on here, right? What's actually happening? But it's so interesting because all of this began with this massive fanfare in 2008. The governor, Matt Blunt at the time, came and was a part of the groundbreaking And he broke ground, and they were talking about it. They're so excited about all this investment in the Branson area, and everybody was on board, and everybody was exciting. Now, I would never trespass, ever. But my wife, Liz, would. And and she invited along her husband, and so the two of them went... um, And this was before the sheriff told us not to, okay? So these photos are from several years back, but we wanted to see them up closer. Or they wanted to, let's talk in the third person, okay? They wanted to see them up closer. And so they went and, and took a look at them. These things have been sitting for 15 years like this with no development at all. Actually, I think just earlier this year, Silver Dollar City bought all of it, all 800 acres, and nobody knows what they're going to do with them yet, but they're going to do something. And they're all waiting, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? What it came down to was, after it was all said and done, the people who started the project never had the money to begin with. That they were doing a fake it until you make it scheme and were hoping that after people saw the initial mansions go up, that people would invest and as a result they would have some money. Like five people went to prison over this. Like because it's called fraud, right? And they didn't have the money. They started, but they didn't have what it took to get through to the end. They didn't count the cost or they counted the cost and didn't care. When I was first considering whether to allow my name to run as pastor of praise. One of the things Elizabeth and I did was we counted the cost. We counted the cost to us personally, to our family, to our relationships, to our friendships, what it would look like to do that. At one point, I was in a room, and I was, um, it was part of the interview process. I was talking to some people about that and what it meant to count the cost. And, and counting the cost to become a pastor. And one person got really angry. He's not here anymore, so I can say this. It's really fun when people leave, because then I can tell all the stories. And uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. 
But this person got really mad at me, and they said, it sounds like you don't even want to be the pastor. And I said, that's not it at all. What I'm saying is, if God has called me to it, I need to count the costs to the calling. What's it going to cost for me to do that? What are the costs? So that when I face them, I'm not surprised by it. Because we have this incredible ability to just kind of like rose-colored glasses press into something, right? Oh, everything's going to be great, and it won't be hard at all, and it's going to be so easy. And that's not reality. There will always be a cost to the calling, and the higher the calling, the greater the cost. So begin by counting the cost. What is the cost that goes along with it? And then he continues on. Jesus says, that's not all you need to do. He says, or would the king, uh, or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against it? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Can you imagine how heady of a feeling it would be to stand at the front of an army of 10,000 people as the one who's in charge? You know what I'm saying? Like, that would feel good. These guys are ready to fight for me. And they're ready to fight, and they're ready to die. I mean, well, if they're not, they better let me know now. But that would feel awesome. And you would feel, at least I think I would feel, invincible. I would feel like there is nothing I could not tackle. Right? So as the king who's in charge with an army of 10,000, that would feel incredible. And hopefully, there would be some people who I could talk to about that. Because 10,000 feels awesome until on the other side of it, there's 20,000. Right? And then all of a sudden, you're like, okay, maybe I wasn't ready for this. But what this says is, man, you better talk to counselors who hopefully, are not new to this whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, there was Solomon's son who was trying to make a decision, and he asked two different groups of counselors. He asked a group of counselors who had been the counselors for his dad, and then he had a group of counselors that he grew up with. And the ones who he grew up with were like, ah, man, you got this. Just do what you want to do, man. And then the other one said, hey, I, 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 we caution, we, we just counsel caution. We think you should take a, a different approach. You can read this story for yourself. And, and then Solomon's son decided, hey, I'm going to take my friend's approach. You don't want a counselor who hasn't been there before. If you've got two groups of counselors and one of them has never seen battle, that is not the counselor that you want to talk to about battle. Anybody? The counselor you want to talk to has got some scars. And they know what it looks like to stand in the front of an enemy who's running right at you. Because they've been there before. And to that, man, let me just say, ask someone who has been there before. Talk to somebody who's done it. You feel called by God to be a missionary? There are people in this church who have been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Talk to them about it and say, what does that look like? Give me some counsel here. You sense a calling to be a doctor. There are doctors in this congregation. Pharmacists, yep. Farmers, ranchers, those two. Pastors, I think I know one or two. Military, every branch I think is represented here. Editors, teachers, speech therapists. Executive, information technologists, photographers, videographers, graphic designers, pilots, business owners, professors, stay-at-home mothers, actuary. Like, we got all of them. And the question is, will you take the time before you press forward to just ask someone who has been there before and can give you some insight? And if you don't know who those people are, just ask around. Hey, do you know anybody who's been a teacher? 
You think that they would be willing to sit down with me? Someone will be able to direct you to somebody who has been called to that same purpose and has done it for years successfully. There are plenty of missionaries in this church. And if you feel called to be a missionary and have not yet taken the time to sit down with them, you're missing out. Ask someone who's been there and has the scars to show for it because they've been there and they've done that. Now, if you cannot find somebody, just send me an email. Here's my email address, alan at praise.church. Send me an email and I will connect you with somebody who has done that, been there, been a part of it, and you can talk to them about what those steps should look like for you. God has called you to something. What do I do now? I don't know, but they do. And they can give you counsel on it. Okay? Anybody with me? So there are people who will connect you with people who have been there and done that. So do it. Okay? Right after that, Jesus says this. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor... How do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Salt is an incredibly stable substance. Um, sodium chloride is not something that, as far as I know, actually loses saltiness. And and there are some people who've come up with one explanation for what Jesus is saying and others who've come up with a different explanation for what Jesus is saying. I don't fully know. It meant probably more to the people who originally heard it than it means to me, and I could throw out some ideas. What I do know is this. What Jesus is saying is, you have been made to be salt. So be salt. You were made for this. So do it. You don't have to wait until you get everything in order to make it happen. You are salt, be it now. And so, man, just let me say, do something. Take a small step right now. One of the greatest issues, I think, is with sometimes when people have like this calling that's in front of them that seems far off and maybe they have a great, I think there's two ways it can go. First, that they have this great vision of what it will be. And they see the end and the perfection of what that will look like. And then the perfection of what it will be keeps them from doing anything right now, right? They envision perfection, and as a result, it paralyzes them because they can't do it perfectly now. This is one of my major failings. If you want to know what one of my major failings is, I see what it could be. And if I can't do it to that level, I'm like, okay, I got to hold until I do. And sometimes, man, that holding until you have everything in order keeps you from ever taking a step to begin with. We see out there what it can look like in the end. And it keeps us from taking a less than perfect step right now. Don't allow perfection to paralyze you. Do something now. Take one step now. Ask a question. Find a place to serve. Participate now. Use that gift now. That's the only way to develop it. Perfection paralyzing you means you'll never work your way towards perfection, right? Perfection paralysis, I think, is just from the enemy. Don't know how to do it? Okay, back up a step and ask those counselors, the people who have been there and done that, they know what it takes to start a business from scratch, to make something from nothing. They know what it means to create something. And if you sense that calling to do something like that, sit down with them and ask them, what should I be doing right now? And they can give you that answer. And not everybody can. So don't go talk to all the other people that are all kind of wondering the same thing. Talk to someone who's been there. And once they tell you what that first step might be, take it. The whole point is that you are salt, so be salty. Live the salt life right now. I believe using your gifting imperfectly matures it. Preserving it for perfection regresses it. And so to our seniors and to those who are students, graduates, hear me for a moment. When I was interviewing, and I've had multiple occasions now to interview for positions of praise. And sometimes it's, we send out and get resumes in from everywhere. And then we have a team that comes together. And sometimes it's the board 
that does those interviews. And sometimes it's a connection through a friend who says, man, this is the person you need to hire. And we interview, and it's obvious that God's in the middle of it. But I've interviewed multiple times. And I've interviewed enough times with students who are juniors and seniors at Evangel or some other school. And I ask them, where are you serving right now? And you know what happens? I hear, well, I wanted to wait until I graduated to find a place to be able to serve. Because I wanted to wait until I had all the tools. That's usually the end of the interview. Because if they're not doing it already, I'm not going to pay them to figure it out. Right? You want somebody who's been there already and have been serving, and as a result, they already know. I believe the best education you can get is during your junior year. I don't care if that's not ministry or if it is. I don't, Liz, her connection, the, she works at American National, great job, she loves it. Her connection there was when she was a junior or whatever it was, maybe it was the beginning of her senior year, she went to the place she was at and she interviewed people who were doing her job. And as a result, she made a connection with somebody who when she graduated, she already could step into that position. Incredible. Why? Because she started before she graduated. And the people who are there can tell you, hey, here's what you need to be doing now in order to get here. So listen to them, hear what they have to say, and serve in some role. I don't care what it is. I believe the most valuable education you will get at school is when you get past the point where you think, well, I really want to enjoy my college experience. (laughs) Wanting to enjoy your college experience is how you end up $120,000 in debt and no job to show for it. Understanding that it's about getting an education and taking a point where you say, you know what, it's time for me to put these things into action and learn from somebody who's doing it. This is why we started the internship program here at Praise, because we wanted to be a part of this process to say to people who are going through that experience, here's what this looks like in real life. Put your hands in the dirt and actually make it happen. And so this idea of wait until I have all the pieces in place to figure it out and then start doing it, all it does is paralyze you from actually learning how to do it and to mature those gifts. And if not that, I think that's one major error. I think the other one is this, that sometimes what we do is not that we see perfection and say, I'm not there yet, but what if it's not perfectly clear what the end looks like? And so because I don't know what the perfectly clear ending looks like, I don't step into it now. I got to wait until God gives me all the answers. And once I have it all figured out, then I'll take the first step. I think that is as much of an error. Because the thing is, Abram, one of the first callings in scripture, definitely one of the most dramatic, God said to him, I want you to step out of the land you're in, and I will bring you to a different land and I will make you a great nation. Now, you and I, looking back at that, we know what that looks like. For Abram, and imagine you and me, God saying to you, I'm going to make you a great nation. What does that even mean? Like, you can't project far enough forward for that to make sense. And for Abram, God tells him these things. And what does he have to do? He has to take a step of faith, not knowing exactly what the end looks like. And through that process, he goes to the land, then he goes to Egypt, and then he comes back, and then finally he has a son. And through that son, he realizes, wait a second, God's going to give me a real family And for me, this is how it worked as well. There was a progressive nature to God's revelation of what God had called me to. When I first accepted Christ, I went to a conference. And I went forward for prayer at the end. And somebody prayed over me and prophesied over me. And I've never told anybody but my wife what that prophecy was. But that person prophesied over me. I've held that very, very close. And I didn't know exactly what that looked like. But at the time, I was in the biomedicine field. That was, that was what I was getting my education for. And I'd done a year at that. And I knew, I just accepted Christ, that I needed to grow in my love of Jesus Christ. And I knew I needed to grow in my love of others, that I needed to mature that. And so I moved to Springfield, Missouri, and started attending a master's commission at Praise Assembly. 
And for three years, I served in that. And I grew in my love of Jesus Christ. And after those three years were over, I knew I needed to grow in my knowledge and understanding of Scripture. And so I said, man, God, it seems like you're in this. And I moved to CBC, and I started my education there. And because of my previous school, I was able to graduate in two and a half years. I tried to take the hardest um, path, path I could take, so I did biblical languages in two and a half years. Hebrew and Greek, and I was so excited about it and terrified at the same time, but God was right in the middle of it, and he did something in me. And over those three years, do you know what I did? I worked in the maintenance team here at Praise Assembly. I served in the children's ministry here at Praise Assembly. I served in the youth ministry here at Praise Assembly, and I served in the Sunday schools here at Praise. Why? Because God had called me to something, and I didn't fully understand what the end would look like, but I knew what I was supposed to do in that moment, and so I did it finished up in December, and I wasn't graduating until May. So I started sending out resumes, because I didn't know. I didn't know what God had ahead of me yet. And so I started sending out resumes, and I interviewed at churches in New York, Pennsylvania, Kansas City, um, uh, St. Louis, Houston, Texas. Flew here, interviewed there, some phone. Some of them I, I prayed about, and man, it just didn't feel right. And, and so I, I pulled back from the process. Another one, it felt just right at first. And then as we found out more about what they were expecting, it, you know what, I don't think this is God. And then another one I go to, and I'm like, well, I could see myself doing this. And then I saw how the pastor talked about people when they weren't in the room, and I said, oh. And then they ghosted me, and I was like, whoa. I'm supposed to ghost you, not the other way around. And I was disappointed and I was heartbroken. Hit March. We felt like God said pause. So we did. We said we're no longer interviewing. We don't know what's ahead. But we just trust God. I graduated in May. The very next day, Pastor Burris called me and said, will you be the children's pastor at Praise Assembly? And then Pastor Fent became the pastor. And he asked me to serve as the student pastor here at Praise Then he asked me to serve as the associate pastor in 2014, right at the end of the year. My name ran for this congregation, and I became the pastor. I didn't know that. When I first decided to stay in Springfield, it was because of Liz. She is a good-looking lady. And so I stayed for her. But then through that, he taught me more. And all along the way, not, not saying that I had it all figured out, But the little steps of faithfulness add up. And so be faithful right where you are. You might not know what the end will look like, or maybe you know perfectly what God has called you to. I'm telling you, whatever it is, do it now in some small step, okay? If God's called you to something. Has God called you to something? Because if he has, that's what you should do. Let me just throw out again, be patient in and with the process. Every person God called throughout scripture. He called them and then there was a process. Right? Abram, I just talked to you about his process. Moses, backside of the desert for 40 years as God is working on him before he calls him back and puts him to work. And what about David? Nobody knew better in scripture what it meant to be anointed for something without actually doing the something to be called to something, to be the anointed one without being the one. He was the anointed king for years before he was the king. Don't try to skip the process. It takes time. You'll learn a ton through it if you submit to it. Know that it takes time and that the journey will be one that God will teach you and help you to learn through and grow through and be matured through and learn perseverance through. But from the beginning, understand that you won't be there before you are here. We want to be there, but you got to start here. And God does something in that process. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, I love this verse. One, it says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Live a life worthy of the calling. That doesn't mean you earn it. What it means is God has called you. Stay humble and gentle. Be patient. Make allowance. And Doug Clay once told me, it was actually when I was installed here at Praise, he said, here's what I encourage you to do. 
every year, read the book by Gene Edwards, A Tale of Three Kings. He said, do that every year. I haven't. Um, <laughs> but I'm averaging like once every 10 years. So I, I figure he's the general superintendent. I'm a pastor. So like I got some room to kind of grow, right? So, but I'm, I'm on it. That's, that book is fantastic about what God can do in you through situations that may not be perfect. So submit to the process. Let God do those things in you. Do what is in your hand to do. Be salt. Live worthy of your calling, whether you see it happening in reality or not. Live it out and take a step towards it. Finally, let's end with this. Seek the Holy Spirit. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And the whole point of Pentecost was that God equips you for what he calls you to. Pastor Burris used to say this all the time. He'll never call you to something he doesn't equip you for. He always equips you for what he has called you to. And John the Baptist, who had the greatest calling according to Jesus until him, who which was prepare the way of the Lord, make straight a path to him. That was John the Baptist calling. And what does it say in John 3.35? It says that he had the Spirit. God gave him the Spirit without limit. Why? Because he had a high calling. God still equipped him for that calling. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit, right? Because you are called to your circle. We are the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones who are called to go out and do something. And he equips us for that. He doesn't send you out and say, ah, figure it out. No, he says, I've got someone and something for you that will equip you for that purpose. And he gives you the Holy Spirit. And I could not do what I do without his help. And one of the things that is scary for some is that experience. The whole point is he is there to help you. So seek his help. Seek him to do what God has called you to do. And I don't care what that is. Whatever the calling, however high or low you think it is, you need his help in order to make it happen. And the experience of the baptism in particular, let's talk about that. That is his equipping for you. Not that everything will be easy from then on out, but he wants to give you power. He wants to give you confidence. He wants to give you the opportunity to have his spirit working inside of you, accomplishing what he's called you to. That is experience for, that is for you. And man, some people let this paralyze them. The opposite of what seeking the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. It is supposed to equip you and prepare you and do those things in you that you cannot do in yourself. So seek him. Seek his presence. Seek his power. Seek that experience because it is for you. I want to go back to where I started. In John, or not John, Luke chapter 14, verse 33. John 14, verse 33. He says there, Jesus says, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. I don't know if you heard that the first time. I'm sure you did. Some of you were like, yeah, he's going to stay away from that verse. <laughs> I mean, serious, everything. That's what Jesus said. Everything. And you read that verse and it can be an intimidating thing. But I think you need to read this verse in light of another verse where Jesus says something very similar. That's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. I've already referred to this verse today, and I refer to it a lot because it's a great verse. Here's what it says in Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered in a field, and in his excitement, your version may say joy, New Living Translation doesn't think people today know what the word joy means. So they go with excitement. I think that gets part of it, but in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. That's the exact same thing Jesus is talking about. 
Someone who gives up everything. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? He's not saying, man, you got to give up everything to follow me. No, he is saying, all that you think you have and that you can keep is nothing compared to what I have for you. And this guy, when he saw what I have for him, he, with excitement, took all those things that he thought he owned and said, this is nothing compared to that. And so with joy and with excitement, he says, I'm taking all that and I'm giving it up because I want that. That's what Jesus is saying there. That's his incredible promise. His promise is that all of those things that you can't keep anyways, it will cost all of them. But you will gain all of those things that are so much better than you can imagine and that no one can ever take away from you. That's what Jesus says. He says, you want to follow me? You got to understand that. You got to understand that all these little things that you think you got together and you own, that all of that rusts and really ultimately comes to nothing. And he goes, I got something that is so much better for you than that. He said, give those things up. Be willing to lay all of that down and you will gain this. See it, understand it. This is my offer to you, Jesus says. And ultimately, he's talking about salvation here. And ultimately, he's talking about healing here. He's talking about forgiveness here. He's talking about a knowledge of God that so changes the way we think and act that it revolutionizes every area of our life. That's his promise. If we don't hold so tightly to these things, that really, quite honestly, aren't worth much anyways, and instead be willing to give that up in order to gain this. He goes, man, it is worth it. Not just worth it, so much worth it that you will see it when you see it, that you'll do it with joy, with excitement. You'll say, ha, none of that means anything. That means everything. That's salvation. And that's what Jesus calls us to. And this calling goes out over and over and over again. That's why you see it all through Scripture that our God is a calling God. That he puts out his invitation and some refuse. Some make excuses. So he says, open it up to everybody. And he puts it out to everybody. And then when he does, all of the sudden from everywhere, people come. And he says, welcome to my banquet. That's my offer to you. That's my offer to you. I'm going to invite you to stand with me today. This is Jesus' offers to those who've never put their faith in him. Those who've never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Those who've never received salvation. But it is also his offer to every single person who has declared him as Lord of their life every single day. This is his calling every single day to every single one of us saying, what I have for you is so much better. Give up that, receive this. Every single day we declare again that he is Lord of our lives. Why? Because either he is or he isn't. And it's so easy for these little things to distract us. And regularly we need to come back to it and say, that is better and I want that. So I'm not going to let this distract me. So for you and for me, man, I don't know what that looks like for you exactly where you're at, but he does. And his calling to you is very specific. He speaks directly to your heart. I know it because I've heard it. That calling when I was far from him and when I've been close to him, the Holy Spirit speaking to me and saying, Alan, I'm speaking right now to you. This is for you. And so today, man, what I want to do is I just want to, I want to end this service by praying. First, declaring him as Lord of my life, and I encourage you to join with me in that, declaring him as Lord of your life, and then committing all to him. Would you join with me in that?